Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and welcome to this exclusive interview with Professor Avinash Paliwar, a distinguished scholar in the field of international relations and deputy director of SOAS South Asian Institute, with an impressive academic background that includes teaching at Defense Studies at King's College, London, and serving as the Defense Academic Postdoctoral Fellow at the Regional Security Research Center at King's. Professor brings a wealth of expertise to our discussion today. So thank you, Professor, for taking your time and speaking to us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So given the current political stalemate in Bangladesh, what are the potential scenarios that could unfold if the Awami League government and opposition parties cannot reach a consensus? Thanks for the question. Uh, right, and it has been brewing for, for years. Uh, the elections are near the opposition parties, uh, whether it's the main opposition party, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, or even smaller parties like Jatiyo, they are alleging very strongly, and I think with some degree of merit, that there are irregularities and malpractices in the past uh, by the Abami League. Uh, and they do not believe that the current government led by Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, will host free and fair elections in 2023-24. So they basically are demanding a caretaker system in which someone else basically, you know, a, a sort of a national unity government is formed for an interim period, which will take control of the electoral mechanisms and perhaps allow some degree of kind of, you know, electoral integrity in this entire process. That's their core demand. And that goes against the constitution of Bangladesh. Now, this is something that was changed in 2013, if I'm if I'm not wrong, by Sheikh Hasina herself, and the caretaker system was kind of ousted. The government, of course, is saying that, you know, they want to abide by this constitution. They want to hold elections as the latest constitutional amendments require them to. And they they, they are saying that it will, these will be free and fair elections and not kind of compromised, perhaps, the way previous elections have been. Now, this is a very zero-sum kind of a political stalemate. Uh, both sides have absolutely no trust in the other. And that makes the situation really kind of fragile. We have already seen state-led, at least, violence against the opposition movement uh, of in the past kind of one year of political move, mobilization that the BNP and other parties have kind of demonstrated, including more recently the jamaat e um, And I think there is one, one pathway if the stalemate is not restored or some sort of a consensus is not reached, is that uh, the protests could become violent with hardliners, both within BNP, within Jamaat, kind of opt the room for violence, which they have not done till now, right? They have, the protesters have been relatively peaceful. Uh, and then, of course, an unlikely scenario as of now, but something that one cannot discount because these grievances against the, the government are not just restricted to the BNP or, or, or the wider society, right? There is a lot of uh, disenchantment with the Awami League as a party, if not Sheikh Hasina herself as a prime minister in Bangladesh, right, for various different reasons. Uh, these disenchantment is there even within the, the officer corps and the rank and file of the Bangladeshi army, right? Um, an institution which has an unfortunately rich history of intervention in the politics of this country. Now, yes, they haven't done so in the past decade or so, but uh, this is something which I think we should be very careful and be cautious about. You cannot rule this kind of an intervention out, uh, you know, just because it hasn't happened in the last kind of few years. So if things become very violent, if, they, if the police is not able to tame the situation or bring law and order and electoral integrity is not guaranteed, um, then there is a chance that the army could intervene, you know, in, in, in the, by, uh, as, as someone who sees itself to be apolitical uh, in nature, but, but that could be a really, that could kind of, you know, open the Pandora's box, as they say, in terms of civil military dislocation, at least. So, so the, those are the couple of, you know, two or three different pathways. They, you know, and also this kind of, Electoral violence could persist long even after elections are held if there is widespread belief that they were not fair.
if people believe that these are fair elections, then yes, things could calm down. But if people continue to believe that elections were unfair, so even after the elections, we could lead, you know, it could lead to a long, prolonged period of instability. And uh, moving on from that, actually, I uh, wanted to ask you that in your interview with the diplomat, you mentioned the possibility of the Bangladeshi army re-entering politics. Uh, so what are the factors that could lead to such an intervention and what could, would be the implications of such a move if the army actually choose to intervene in the elections? I think the factors are very clear. As I responded in the diplomat interview as well, that, uh, look, if there is acute instability and the army comes in, then the army comes in as a, you know, as a vanguard institution, not just providing law and order, but also viewing itself as the guarantor of the political system of that particular state, right? Uh, and that's not necessarily a democratic intervention. That's by definition an illiberal kind of intervention by an armed force. Uh, what could lead, what are the factors you asked that would lead to look, there are two or three aspects to this, right? The army has been in the barracks since let's say 2009 broadly put and definitely from 2011 onwards. And there was a failed attempt uh, of a push within the army uh, in 2011, which was, of course, nipped in the bud then. They have been within the barracks and they've held that promise that we'll not interfere directly in the electoral, civilian electoral systems based on the prom promise by the by the prime minister, by Sheikh Hasina, that she'll respect the political nature of the institution. She will make sure that, you know, kind of governance failures or any criticism that is mounted against the government does not harm the respect of the armed institution. And the fact that, look, this is an institution which does not have a direct external adversary, right? Potentially there could have been, a Myanmar could have been an adverse, uh, adversary, but India is not a direct threat in a territorial sense in that, that way. So it needs a purpose in some fundamental ways, apart from securing borders and delivering on humanitarian aid. It uh, wanted defense contracts and it has got a good share of budgetary allocation in the recent past as part of in Bangladesh's kind of economic development. And it also, the officer corps also kind of enjoyed plump postings in Africa as part of the United Nations Peacekeeping Corps, which, which are very highly paid, handsomely paid kind of you know prestigious positions. So, so that kept the army broadly happy and they didn't feel the need to be part of to enter politics. And that also kind of buttressed the sense of professionalism, a political profession. If this this balance that was this has which has been struck since 2009, and, and mind you, this balance was struck because there was a during the 2009 Bangladesh Rifles mutiny attempt, uh, India did use coercive, dip, undertook course of diplomacy with Dhaka and said that, you know, this is a political problem and the political leader that is then Sheikh Hasina, uh, she will have to deal it as she sees fit. Not, uh, uh, you know, the army cannot just go and start shooting against the mutineers. Um, that was that that also kind of sealed the deal as far as politicization of the army was concerned, in which they were very clear that you know you have there's a there's a Lakshman Rekha as we call it in India, or there's a there's a red line you cannot cross in politics. Uh, in this context, if the civilian government is not able to keep its side of the deal or its side of the bargain, right? Uh, if it is not able to kind of uh, offer the kind of respect that the military deserves. Uh, if it's not able to give the kind of patronage or the kind of uh, defensive, the financial allocations that they want the, and they believe is part of the bargain. And on top of that, there is acute instability uh, within the country as part of, uh, you know, the electoral standoff that we see play out. Then I think we can see a bit of, you know, there's a risk of dislocation there. And again, I want to underscore this is not imminent. It's not likely as of now, but I would not discount it because we don't know which direction the situation might spiral in the coming weeks. Uh, elections are nearing and you can see the protest momentum hasn't gone down. And you can also see that the Avami League, that Sheikh Hastina's kind of, you know, they're her captains in the political party. They're also nervous in terms of where this will go. So the implications of that, uh, such kind of a military maneuver could be really grave. We don't know, first of all, how long the military would then last in power, how brutal it could be, uh, what measures it will take, uh, what are the guarantees it will you know, offer to its neighbors. And again, it's also operating in a space where the China, India, US strangular sort of competition in Bangladesh has exacerbated quite, quite strongly. Uh, 
outside influences much more than a political party has been you know so this is the other thing the if if you're looking at a political party that comes on a strong electoral mandate it is very difficult for external parties to kind of influence them using vested interests because they have a democratic mandate but if you have a human power and civilian authority and leader it's easier for external parties to kind of exploit their internal contradictions more and that is what we have seen happen with sheikh hasina right i mean sheikh hasina india has banked on sheikh hasina very strongly but she has actually given a lot of leeway to chinese influence and interest over the past decade unprecedented in some ways uh, much more than the bnp ever did during its brief stint in party 2016 or even in the 90s right um, so this is something that we need to be very careful about there is a there's a political or a geopolitical logic to why electoral free and fair elections are important it brings in domestic checks and balance against competition geopolitical competition so and if a military junta sitting in power in dhaka they are even more susceptible than hasina to chinese influence i would i would believe so that's that's a very serious implication moving forward if that happens yeah and since you mentioned actually the external actors which can influence the situation uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the role of india the united states or china in the ongoing crisis in bangladesh and how they might influence the situation and what interest do they have in the region in the first place so look there is india has a very clear interest in stability and prosperity of bangladesh there's no doubt doubt there's no no doubt about that it's you know these are you know immediate neighbors there's a very rich history of you know partnership uh, the 1971 war the liberation um, these are very live aspects as far as bangladesh society is concerned so india is very clear that look we want we have two or three aspects which we want to security elements we want the minority communities especially the hindu minorities of bangladesh to be protected to prosper nationalist party has traditionally been more conservative and willing to cut a deal political deal or enter political alliances with the likes of jamaat e islami right um, so this is something the minority protection element is very very big as far as india's approach towards bangladesh is concerned the second thing is we you know in new delhi would not want the electoral process to bring in elements or political elements in bangladesh empower them Uh, which would be willing to host separatists and kind of militant actors eh, targeting India's northeastern states, um, and given the situation in Manipur, this is an issue which has become even more pressing than 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 it was before May twenty twenty three. There is a rich history, unfortunately, where BNP hosted rebels against India during when it was in power in the seventies, eighties, nineties as well. Um, but then India has also hosted anti Bangladesh rebels in the past. It's not a one way street. These are these are geopolitical games that states play. Hasina actually cracked down on a lot of these elements. and that is something that india has not forgotten and is unlikely to forget any time soon right a lot of uh, the security dynamics became changed and got calmed down as far as india was concerned and it's northeast right um, and sheikh hasina and his her government especially after 2009 played a important role in that effect so india has a very direct stake in what happens in the election and i would say that india is less worried about democratic integrity to be honest in bangladesh because if 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 a like, democracy brings in an anti india force that's not in your national interest so india they won't say it out loud of course but indian policy makers are very clear that if if you know has hasheen sheikh hasina remains in power whichever way possible that is something that they will not be overly worried about because they don't know what the bnp will do if it does come to power in a free and fair elections US and China have their own different kind of ball game going on over there here. You know, US has never had the kind of extensive strategic footprint in Bangladesh that many ex, you know many ex, many see, you know, it having in different parts of the of of the world. But it has opted for a very clear approach of uh, you know sticking to its ideological kind of moorings of supporting democracy elsewhere. and it does not want to do it over like over course of you of course given the mishaps in afghanistan and elsewhere in iraq but they are very clear that they want to take measures which would at least inch bangladesh towards much more represented really representative and participatory form of politics it did, did that did that in 2014 so there's nothing new in american position but this time round i think it's less at least till now it has been less amenable to indian advocacy of letting hasina run this this show as as india sees it it to be in its own interest at least to widely um china has actually taken a very clear call in favor of hasina 
uh, Ratna Deep. So this is something which is very interesting. Not only has China's strategic ingress has been quite spectacular, both in terms of financial capital being given to you know aid, um, defense collaboration between Beijing and Dhaka has been quite unprecedented as well. So China is very clear that they don't want to one intervene in the electoral processes, and they are actually very happy with Hasina being in power. And they very clearly said that we will support Sheikh Hasina in her endeavor, whatever that may entail. And that is a that is a position which has in some ways kind of complicated India's choices because both India and China are supporting the same person, same political party, same candidate, same leader, but trying to outbuild each other. And we don't know which whether India will be able to keep Hasina on its side moving forward. Uh, and this is a conversation that you know India and US need to have sooner than later. What is the real, really, the vision here? What are the drives? What are the kind of you know outcomes that they expect? Um, otherwise, China might become the biggest beneficiary of a Indo-US standoff on Bangladesh. Whoever comes to power, whether it's a BNP or or, or Sheikh Hasina, so this is a conversation which is uh, worth having for these parts. The relationship between the Bangladeshi army and the ruling party, the Awami League, has been stable for over a decade. So could you provide insight into how politicized the army is currently and whether it has an appetite for a large, larger role in politics, given most of their needs are over there, as you mentioned earlier, has been fulfilled? No, as I mentioned earlier, these needs are not being fulfilled as much anymore. That's the thing. If they were fulfilled, right, uh, the crisis has actually kind of shaken up the the military hierarchy, the military class, because they feel that this was uh, this is an issue which has kind of undermined the sovereignty of Bangladesh. And the Myanmar army has been able to pull off a, a, a genocide without any serious repercussion. Of course, I mean, Myanmar, there's a civil war since the coup, but... Uh, or a renewed civil war since the coup. Um, but the Bangladeshi army has been unhappy with the accommodative response by by Sheikh Hasina of the of the Rohingya refugees. And it is always advocated that look, this will become a security problem tomorrow, if not today. And it is becoming a security problem, right? Various kind of security concerns that they are mounting. So they want to have a more coercive approach towards Myanmar as far as the Rohingya crisis is concerned. They do want to ensure repatriation. They want to be mobilized. They want to be supported. And uh, that that issue has become sort of a lightning rod around which a lot of different sort of grievances within the armed forces, if not at the top level, but at least at the middle officer level, have kind of come to coalesce together. Uh, and this is where it becomes uncertain. This is where I say there is a risk, if not likely. The top brass might not be willing to do this on their own will, you know, by their own choice that you want to interfere. But if... Sheikh Hasina is unable to deliver on the electoral standoff, things become violent, and there is a push from within the armed forces to do something about it, then I think the choices of the army chief becomes increasingly limited of what he can or cannot do. Um, so this is something, again, I would say that, you know, uh, it's politicization, it's a, you know, part Bangladeshi army is, it's, it's it has seen its own share in power, politically speaking, in the past, right? And a lot of these officers who are now chiefs came, rose through the ranks and rose through, you know, the armed, uh, the processes of, you know, of the Bangladeshi army through that period of politicization. So I don't think this is that the idea of political interference is that alien to the armed forces. Um, they may or may not decide to act upon it, but they clear, you know, there is, there is a sense that, okay, if you know, something has to give in this kind of a situation. Uh, and if, look, if there is kind of back channel signaling that happens, let's say the Beijing says to the army chief that, look, we think you can handle this thing better and you'll have our support. You never know this which, which direction the wind will blow. So the point here I'm trying to underscore is not to, to say that, look, the army will intervene tomorrow, but saying that the structural situation and the temporal situation as well in, in around the elections is evolving in a direction which is, which should make us be more aware of you know the, situ the the army's decision making, the top process decision making, uh, because they they have a stake, they have a stake, direct stake in the system. So if the system gets dislocated, they lose a lot. So they would also want to protect that. So that opens up avenues for uh, you know for intervention of different sorts and kinds. But uh, it's worth keeping being aware of it. Uh, this brings me to actually a question that I wanted to ask you: that both Pakistan and Bangladesh, we have seen a fair share of military rule actually in the region. But the amount yeah. of villainization that we see of Pakistani army, it's not the same level that we see for the Bangladeshi army, whether it's in the media, whether it's in the academia. Uh, why is that so? See, the 
That's an interesting question. Look, the way Bangladeshi army in part has been seen, firstly, there is a general lack of work, both academic and media reportage on Bangladesh. That's one structural feature. Pakistan attracts much more diplomatic media, academic attention than Bangladesh ever has, uh, apart from the 1971 war, which of course, right, uh, a lot of scholars also focus. But Bangladesh is one of those countries where people don't really kind of focus attention unless they really want to for whatever reason they do. So that's one structural feature, regardless of who's in power in Bangladesh. Uh, so I personally believe that, you know, academics and scholars have done a disservice to South Asia uh, or the subcontinental study and geopolitics by not focusing on East Pakistan and Bangladesh as much as it deserves. There has been no work, let's say, on what uh, the geopolitics of East Pakistan was before 1971, right? What, how was, let's say, how were Indian policymakers looking at the politics only of East Pakistan before the war happens, right? Uh, what was Sheikh Mujib's relationship with, let's say, India? before while he was still a parliamentarian within pakistan united pakistan those are questions which will i mean that's one part of my own project to kind of you know unpack these histories but um, i do feel you know that that there is an asymmetry of reportage and asymmetry of scholarship between these two countries but i think in terms of qualification like those people who actually focus on bangladesh like scholars media uh, they are very clear that historically, I mean, there has been a lot of undercurrent or, you know, there has been uh, uh, elements within the Bangladeshi army who have been supportive of all these kind of Islamist forces and cross-border militancy who have been susceptible to external sort of influence, both from the Pakistan, from Pakistan and other countries, China. And that, I think, uh, there is a body of literature that underscores that. It's not new if you would be focusing on Bangladesh and what happened. For example, I'll give you the case of the 1975 coup when Sheikh Mujib was killed in November, a new kind of regime under Zia Rahman, they come to he comes to power. There's a very clear shift in the ideological moorings of, of Bangladesh, right? From Joy Bangla or this Bengali it, it, linguistic kind of nationalism, which is syncretic and secular in, in some fundamental ways. You go towards Bangladesh in the bath, which is very, you know, very clearly opting for Urdu, an Urdu slogan, very, very clearly having people who are associated to different uh to Jamal, but also other kind of uh, radical or conservative Islamic formations making them part of governance. Even those people who killed uh, the killed Ongoban Sheikh Mujib, they were also part, they were also actually cut it back, they were protected um, by 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 that regime. So that those elements, that relationship historically has not been um, you know, it has been understood. It's not been avoided or ignored. That history is known. So I would say that, you know, it's not a matter of people vilify Pakistan more than they vilify Bangladesh less. I think that's a kind of a different kind of a framing, which I don't really agree with. I think those who actually focus on Bangladesh are very acutely aware of which direction, you know, these forces can take and have taken in the past. Um, and if I ask actually that how credible are the claims made by the Awami League that a victory by, Bang by the Bangladesh Nationalist Party and its allies would actually boost the Islamist force in Bangladesh and allow the army to creep in again in Bangladeshi politics. So what is the current strength of these Islamist groups? So there is, look, the Islam, I mean, jamaat e islami for example, and hifazat e islam which is a movement that emerged a few years back, um, among other sort of Islamist forces. And let, let, let me first also clarify, Islam or conservative Islamic political parties, and Islamists. These are two very different things, right? Often today we confuse the two. Islamists are basically really violent, sort of revolutionary ideologues within the rubric of political Islam who are willing to use force um, and to target innocents, also, right? What we understand as terrorism. But uh, not every political Islamic group is an Islamist. So that's very important to keep that distinction out there and clear. Jamaat e Islami is a bigger ideological parent body of Islamic thought, which wants to practice Islam in public life, wants to have their own legal systems, which are very deeply conservative, problematic. But they're not all Islamists, right? They're not all advocating violence. So that's one that's, it's very important to keep that distinction in mind. But yes, 
uh, Islamists in Bangladesh have had association and have had kind of intellectual pedigree coming from the Jamaat. Now, Jamaat is a Qadr-based institution. It's a very long-standing kind of political outfit, political movement that existed in South Asia, in Pakistan, Bangladesh. And I think because of its nature, because of its intellectual and kind of historical pedigree, you know, conservative pedigree, it has been able to withstand a lot of the onslaught that it has faced, very violent onslaught by the Sheikh Hasina government, right? Um, so it is, you know, it has survived that period of, uh, so to say, forced downtime, if you like, you know, for the lack of a better term. It recently hosted a meeting, a public meeting in Dhaka, and there's clearly a sense that, you know, it's not done, you know, Jamal Islam is not dead political party. So yes, those conservative Islamic outfits are there. They have not gone. If anyone is that they have gone and they are not politically potent. I think they're that's incorrect. But are they as influential and as electorally uh, potent, perhaps as they were before 2013, 2012? I don't think so. Uh, there are two different reasons for that. Generally, the Bangladeshi public is not very. I mean, the appeal of Jamaat Islami is limited to certain pockets in Bangladesh. You know, the the rising middle class, the urban elites of Bangladesh, they don't really see eye to eye with Jamaat's form of kind of Islam as such, even if they are conservative, even if they practice Islam. Sheikh Hasina herself does the namaz five times from what I've been told, uh, but that does not make her an Islamist, right? I mean, and there are many people in Bangladesh. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And post the International Crimes Tribunals, which were held, I think, after 2011-12, a lot of the top leadership of the Jamaat, uh, you know, which was much more radical, but which had much more uh, ability to deliver violence, perhaps, or guide people who can deliver violence in a strategic way, they were literally eliminated. They were put to the gallows. So they don't exist anymore. So today we are looking at an outfit which is there, which is not dead, which is trying to mobilize itself, but which is also quite, you know, does not have that kind of widespread appeal. Uh, so if you have elections, Jamaat won't be able to win much kind of, you know, seats, so to say. But also they're split from within. People forget jamaat e islami Bangladesh is really ideologically split along generational and ideological lines on the question of liberation. Jamaat in 1971 did not want liberation to happen. It did not want East Pakistan to secede uh, from, from Pakistan, right? And that has been one of the biggest source of grievance for all all Bangladeshis, including people in the BNP. The BNP is not a, I mean, Zia Rahman fought, was one of the most important theatre commanders in the Liberation Force, uh, in the Bukti Bahini, right, himself. So, so BNP is actually populated by pro-liberation forces, and they, you know, the, the jamaat e islami that's a taint, let's say, the ideological taint uh, that it has had to historically contend with. So the new generation, and the old guard always has been seen, the old guard Jamaat has always been seen as one of those who supported the idea of not liberating, right? Instead of actually seeking proactive liberation. The new generation is resisting this. The new generation of Jamaatis are very clear that, look, you cannot, uh, don't want to be seen as someone who did not want liberation, even though we are Jamaatis. So you can see that struggle kind of play out in multiple shapes and forms. One thing is Jamaat's own political lines have been diluted a little bit on this question too. A lot of the younger cohort uh, or the middle kind of, you know, mid-aged cohort of the Jamaat have actually split away from the Bangladesh party, which wants to be registered, right? Um, so this is, you can see this these splits. So Awami Lee coming and saying that, look, if the BNP comes, suddenly there'll be a huge boost to Islamists. I'm, 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 I'm skeptical about that. Uh, and the other reason for that is the BNP power since 2006 and to come back to power it needs to have a platform of its own it has to have a political identity and push of its own and that push will not be given or will not come by adopting conservative political islam in 2023 bangladesh so this was one very clear reason why bnp is not in an official alliance with the jamaat today it is not even coordinating its protests with the jamaatis yes jamaat does its own protests against awami league or the government uh, but that's not i mean bnp even on the ground the bnp cadre is very clear that we are not getting into any tactical alliance but yeah if there if you ask me 
And do they maintain contact? Yes, even Awami League main, maintains contact with the Jamaat. It's not as if these people don't talk to each other. That's that's, but that is not a benchmark of assessing where the political winds are blowing. So that's where my skepticism comes from. That uh, anyone coming and saying that look, BNP's victory will suddenly shift Bangladeshi political fulcrum to the right, uh, perhaps to a certain extent, but not to the extent that many people are pitching it to be. Uh, in fact, BNP is very clearly making promises to all sides that, look, we are going to protect the minorities much better than the Awami League has. We'll protect the Hindus much better than the Awami League has. Uh, and we can do it much better because we have that, uh, we have this history of connections with the Islamists and we know how to tackle them better. Um, so, so, so let's see. I am not yet convinced by the pitch that uh, it will be, you know, Bangladesh will become an Islamist safe haven just because there's change of card in Dhaka. I'm not convinced of it yet. But yes, this is something that we don't know till it actually happens as well. You never know which direction BNP goes once it is in power. And we cannot credibly assess how which direction it will go in because it has not been in power for 14, 15 years. So that's something which we need to which we need to see. And that's pretty interesting because I think one of the other understudied subject is how uh, the Jamaat actually, till its time when it was banned from 2013 to the current, how it actually survived and how it actually actively even involved in the Bangladeshi politics is really understudied. And that actually brings me to the question of how, what are the factors that have contributed to the resurgence of the Jamaat actually? We've seen the rally over after yeah. a decade that took place. So yeah. what role this lobby groups in Washington has played in advocating the Jamaat and the Bangladesh National Party in interaction with the US government? So I would think that two very different things, Ratandeep. I mean, to conflate lobbying in DC with Jamaat's resurgence, I think that's is a very two kind of apples and oranges kind of a comparison. So let's first unpack Jamaat. As I mentioned, to you know, I'll build on the point that I made earlier, Carter-based parties, right, they're very difficult. To, it's very difficult to kind of completely wipe off ideologically charged cadre. Even if they're small in numbers, they're committed to a cause. Whether you like the cause or not is a very different matter. Um, and they often, you can see that they, you know, that they, there's a there's a lineage, ideological kind of lineage. And this, these are these are not run by family, families as such. Like both of Ami League and BNP are family run parties effectively, just like the Congresses in India or just like the Bhuttos or the PMLN in Pakistan. It's it's a classic South Asian phenomenon. But Jam Jamaat is not. Right, they are actually they they have an idea of what politics should look like, and they would get people who you know they'll train people in that their politics. Uh, in that sense, it's 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 an ideological parent body, and that gives them a lot of resilience. I'll give you a counter example in India. Right, the during the emergency years of Indira Gandhi, when the Hindu right, uh, the Jansang was kind of really under the boot. Um, a lot of its leaders were jailed. A lot of its, you know, uh, cadres of the RSS were jailed in different parts of the country. They were able, they were resilient because RSS has also been a, a cadre based movement, right? The, the shakhas uh, that have existed historically. And that's what is the so core source of strength for the BJP also. You have this, the RSS, which has a very powerful presence across the country. So any ideologically, you know, any ideologically driven cadre based political outfit, regardless of what the ideology is, where they are, uh, it's, it gets very difficult to tame, to contain them, so to say, in, in that sense, especially using force. The more force you use on them, the more, you know, you kind of increase the politics of martyrdom. You feed the politics of, you know, the, the politics of uh, isolation, the politics of, you know, uh, revenge as well at some point. So this has what this is what has driven the Jamaat uh, throughout this period, a new leadership has emerged, which perhaps, you know, which is looking at the whole thing much more tactically moving forward. Now, how has that interacted, that resurgence on the ground? And I would still, I'm still open to the question of how much resurgence have they really had? Because, I mean, we're looking at one public meeting. I mean, it's not as if they're kind of, you know, one public meeting in South Asian society is not big deal. You can mobilize people over, you know, for chai and samosa. That's not something that suddenly makes you resilient. But yes, jamaat islami has a wider appeal and that has to be appreciated. In terms of lobbying by the Jamaat and the BNP in the US government, I think, again, there is, this is, you know, this has to be unpacked at various levels. One, this idea or this narrative that BNP has very strong lobbying power in Western capitals. This is partly accurate, but partly also inaccurate. 
right? BNP has a lot of, the main leader of BNP, that's Tariq Rahman, he lived in London. Uh, and he runs the show. He's actually mobilizing the entire party from London using all Zoom chats and whatnot, right? Facebook lives. Uh, that gives him some degree of say, or that gives the party some degree of influence in shaping the agenda of Western capitals. That's the same in the United States, right? And US, there's much more functional kind of lobby groups which operate. That's not the case in the United Kingdom. It's a different kind of a conversation that plays out. But do US government or United United Kingdom's government only buy what these lobby groups are saying? No, they take their own view. Uh, their embassies in Dhaka have a very robust sort of uh, feedback loops that are going on, you know, between the two capitals. And they're very, you know, it's not that difficult for anyone who's focusing on Bangladesh today to make a case that the Awami League has taken a very deeply authoritarian turn and a very violent authoritarian turn. It's, 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 it's nobody's case, really. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's anyone who has a basic understanding of how politics works will be able to assess that this is happening. Uh, and I think the very, you know, the fact that the U.S., especially under a democratic administration, is committed to to some free fair electoral election, some free fair election, some integrity, electoral integrity. Bangladesh becomes a case where you can actually push it, right? Uh, you can actually afford to push that kind of a conversation, and you're doing that. Whether it's sanctioning the Rapid Action Battalion, which sanctions army officers, or another source of unhappiness within the army of you know having to get sanctioned for political acts which Hasina wants them to do. Um, or threatening sanctions or visa visa kind of uh, sanctions against those individuals or groups which the U.S. thinks will potentially kind of undermine elections. Um, I think these are assessments that the State Department or Whitehall in London have made most likely themselves. There's only as far as BNP lobbying will go in convincing these governments. I mean, they have... You know, I know people in these institutions, they have their own minds, they have their own channels. And, they, you know, you can't have some lobby group come and tell them this is what the situation is. They can they can assess it themselves. So I don't think the U.S. position has been to, okay, we will revive the Bangladesh Jamaat Islami because that's what we like. No, they don't. They are not. I mean, it's a liberal, you know, administration in that sense. They don't want the Jamaatis to get suddenly empowered and start the undertaking terrorist activity or enabling those groups which have a terrorist intent both within Bangladesh and outside. I don't think that's what the case really is. But yes, if you look at it from New Delhi, you start joining dots. Uh, and then New Delhi kind of has its own assessment that, oh, the Americans are pushing the BNP or the Americans are pushing the Jamaat. I think that's an inaccurate assessment to a certain degree. Uh, and I think that's that's where the sad bit is that the US and India, despite a very strong bilateral relationship, as we saw even in G20 recently kind of play out, um, they have not had any serious conversation on Bangladesh. As to, you know, we're completely out of sync with each other. So where, where do we go from here? And I really hope they start coming together and at least discussing uh, what next. But isn't Bangladesh like a sort of an important pivot for the both US and India to stir their Indo-Pacific dream because of the regional and the geopolitical importance? So why can't, like, we have seen actually of both like Asina actually coming out with statements which are kind of like very ideologically different. Uh, on one point we see she actually spot in the US, I mean, the free Indo-Pacific agreement that we had, actually. It was kind of a Western line, but we see she does not take a complete stand, uh, whether it's towards the Western slant or whether it's towards the Chinese land. So why can't the US and the Indian government sit down together with the Bangladesh government to actually have a conversation on this? Yeah, that's the question I asked too, Ritandeep. They should, they haven't. And I don't understand why. It's clearly Bangladesh is very important, not just look for Indo-Pacific and all that is one thing, but it's, it's very important for India. It's a Near Eastern thing, right? If there's a serious, if there is serious instability in Bangladesh, it will hurt India. Full stop. We have seen what happens when there is instability in Myanmar. Manipur is a classic case in point, right? Uh, Bangladesh instability could be much worse for India than what was going on in Myanmar. And the, Myanmar is a country where the only other power which has some degree of strategic equity to deliver impact and effect on the ground, it's China, neither India nor United States. Bangladesh, that is not the case. But if you lose Bangladesh as well, then that's that's a serious problem. Then, what, then I mean, you know, 
then you're only talking maritime spaces when you're talking into pacific you're not talking geographies or kind of land geographies or demographies so this is very important for the two sides to kind of sit together i don't think the bangladeshi government will need to be a party to that conversation i think indian us will have to come and make up their minds and convince the other of their argument uh bilaterally before anyone else come become part of that kind of conversation also hasina has had a very complicated relationship with the west look she went to the united states a few weeks back and stayed there for 5 days didn't get a single meeting worth its while with with the with the biden administration the fact that you know and then she also kind of lambasted the us in the jatiya sansad saying that you are trying to initiate regime change and then in delhi g20 she's taking a selfie or is being made to take a selfie i don't know with biden so 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 i think there is a very kind of um, there's a lot of tumult within the awami league of how to deal with the kind of pressure they are facing from the united states and their gut reaction is to go balance it by going siding tilting much more towards china and that complicates india's position in between right um, so this is something again india and china have very limited uh, you know india and china can't talk bangladesh but the un fact is that right now it seems that their policies are mirroring each other rather than competing so i really hope that uh, india and us come together and talk about this right um, us will have to take india security concerns in perspective you know it cannot over- overlook them that's not going to be helpful but india will also have to consider the fact that look just uh, having someone in power an authoritarian even autocrat uh, in the shape of sheikh hasina is not going to you know advance your national security forever at some point you want a force which has a c- certain degree of acceptability within the wider bangladeshi society Uh, and only elections can deliver that it look bangladesh awami league might even win free and fair elections we don't know uh, because we have not seen free and fair elections and that's a fair ask by anyone who's who's there right uh, so this is something that you know us will have to convince india of the situation and vice versa in some cases about you know india security concerns so one uh, last question that i wanted to ask you with the jamaat islami before uh, i move forward to your research paper uh it's that we have seen actually how the pakistani jamaat islami actually uh, has this some like uh, like it capitalizes on social work to build its image uh yeah. like how does uh, the bangladeshi jamaat islami uh, has a mass support and what are the potential implications uh, if they come into a certain sort of a position in the upcoming elections so Pratin Deep, as I said earlier, I don't think Jamaat Islami in Bangladesh has mass appeal. They are there. It's a politically, I mean, it's an important force in some ways in Bangladeshi society. But will that translate? In, and they, they could perhaps deliver street violence in certain pockets of the country if situation gets violent. So that that threat element is there. But will they be able to marshal many votes in a free and fair election? I don't think so. so that's so, so so that mass appeal that automatic equation of jamaat islami having big mass appeal leading to certain electoral outcomes that's that's you know i think the party which will marshal a lot of uh, anti incumbency votes is going to be the bnp so if you have free and fair elections the chances of bnp winning them are pretty high without any alliance with the jamaat um so this is something again i i want to caution against this this tendency to see jamaat as an oversized influence in bangladeshi politics it's it's not today it's not uh so so it has a threat to, you know it has the capability to deliver violence on the street if things become violent but does not have the appeal uh, to garner votes or to marshal mass votes um that would change the electoral landscape i don't think so so uh, coming now to your article actually that uh, you've written with paul uh, titled strategy secrecy and external support for insurgent groups where you lay down india's intervention strategies So, can you explain the concept of covert deterrence as it is described in the paper, particularly in the context of India's support to dissidents in Bangladesh historically? Yeah. So, this article basically emerged from a conversation that Paul Stanelan at the University of Chicago and I were having about, you know, India's uh, which of the cross-border rebels has India have supported historically, in what ways, when, why, to what extent. Uh, and we realize this is a very fascinating case study in some ways because if you look at the subcontinent we see pakistan support for taliban and lashkar e taiba or other group kind of you know islamist groups or terrorist groups however you like to call them has been pretty high and very deeply studied as well right it also generated a lot of uh, policy interest thanks to the global war and so called global war on 
terror um, but india's case is not not generated the only cases in india which have actually generated interest historically that to all india's kind of you know some degree of support to the tamil tigers in sri lanka during the early 80s you know, which of course a story then became you know really went down south after 87 intervention of the ipkf so we wanted to kind of explore as to why india did this and then we thought that the why the it's a conceptual conversation to be had yet yeah, while looking at india's case then we realized so okay uh the element of covert deterrence that you have asked me right i mean here there are two things intent and technique of how do you go about supporting it. and we realize that you know states have or sponsoring states have different goals and different intent when they support rebels in a different country right it could be defensive uh, intent in which you support rebels but not because you want to see a regime change or you want to kind of compel the other government target government into doing something that they otherwise will not do but you just create a buffer right you know let's say you have certain border communities where it's just thing or there's a separatist insurgency running in let's say pakistan in balochistan or elsewhere you support them just to keep the other state a bit off balance to contain uh, serious damage to your own national interests as you see your national security strategic interest but then there could be a much more uh, you know offensive intent in, involved in which you want to change regimes you want to kind of make the other country do things which are which are you know which they wouldn't otherwise when you're willing to use force right that's offensive thing mm-hmm. and the interplay of intent with escalation risks because you know if you do something it also depends on how the target states react and how much can they react right if you arm a rebel group in xyz country and if the xyz country really kind of pushes back very hard that that could lead to a wider escalation which you don't want that that interaction between intent and secret uh, and escalation risk determines whether you will offer you know whether you'll op, op, op for op, overt support open support or open sponsorship of rebels or covert right and this creates three or four different pathways you could have covert deterrence or overt deterrence or you could have uh, covert revisionism and overt revisionism four different kind of pathways in which a government could support a rebel group now covert deterrence here simply means that you know the there is risk of escalation but you don't want to kind of you know you don't want to really change the regime either uh in the other side so you keep it low you keep it low key whatever support you're giving to the rebels just to signal the other government to not uh, harm your interests or to contain the fall back, fallout of those interests so that is what leads to sort of covert covert deterrence and in case of bangladesh i think the covert deterrence case has been more viewed after 71 because in 71 war it was quite overt revisionism right india actually formally kind of intervened um this was the india support to the shanti bahini the chakma rebels uh, so to say right the wherein the there was a very kind of systematic targeting of uh, ethnic minorities or indigenous groups communities in the chittagong chittagong hill tracts which border mizoram manipur those areas and that led to a lot of dislocation of people displacement of people many of the chakma community members came into india became refugees had to be supported and fed by this government of india which they were not very kind of keen on doing or they went to tripura also so so you start arming them and that becomes a pressure point against the zia rahman's regime with whom you have very frosty ties so you don't want to do something which will lead to the toppling of zia rahman himself but you want to make sure that you're arming all these groups secretly or at least if, even if it's an open secret people might know but not officially accepting that support uh, to complicate the the costs of you know enmity with india for the for zia rahman at that point in time in the 70s and 80s so that is where the birth in our view of covert deterrence really you know conceptual birth of covert deterrence as a strategy of sponsorship of rebels really came from and if i move on from that and ask you about uh, like india's profile actually uh, in the current since you mentioned about covert deterrence in this context uh, how much of india's influence has been on bangladeshi elections uh, covertly uh, or in covert deterrence not in a from a regime change but to actually help the dissidents out there and what are the significant risk and cost of escalation of india's decision making regarding its support for either rebel groups or a particular party so our 
article is very focused on rebel groups, not on managing elections abroad. That's a very different. So we do not want, I don't want to use these conceptual terms uh, with, you know, focusing on electoral kind of processes in a third country, in a sec in, in the target state, uh, because the paper is really very much focused on rebel groups or armed secessionist movements uh, or revolutionary movements for that, that matter. Um, so I don't think the analysis could lend much focus in helping answer your question. But again, as far as India is, look, India is a very important part in Bangladesh. I think perhaps the important, most important, more than China, more than America. And geography is, geography makes sure that's the case. History makes sure that's the case. The cultural connect between Bangladesh and India, the Bengal connect, uh, that in, in, India will remain the most important actor whatever happens, and will also be the first responder. I mean, if something goes wrong in Bangladesh very seriously in the security sense, the first country that will respond, use and force if required, will be India, none, none else, right? So so I think uh, that that strategic structural aspect we have to kind of acknowledge and respect. But in terms of India's interference in elections, I don't think, look, that is the that is the allegation by the opposition BNP that India has supported secretly Awami League's League staying in power. Uh, but I think India has actually pretty openly supported Awami League being in power more than secretly. I mean, the India didn't do the rigging for Awami League. I mean, India, that's something Hasina and her captain perhaps allegedly, you know, well, did during previous elections. But uh, India accepted her uh, Hasina's law political longevity. It did not question her claim that, you know, this was all free and fair. And it did not kind of press or investigate much on BNP's claim or the opposition's claim that this was, there was a lot of electoral malpractices, even if it realized that that was indeed the case. So I think that's a political decision making that is going on rather than uh, rather than active arming of any dissident group or anything else. I don't think till the time Hasina is power, India will be arming anyone against her. Uh, that is not in India's interest to kind of, you know, harm the family or Hasina that is. And uh, lastly, wanted to ask you, like, uh, India's, a lot of experts have mentioned that India's profile in this current election especially appears to be, uh, I mean, low-key compared to the previous elections. And they have not gone uh, overtly support, as you also uh, mentioned, like, the previous elections. So can you explain the reason behind India's approach and whether it aligns with India's strategic interest in the region to actually not look overtly supportive at this point of time? See, I think the political position is actually very clear. I think some of the questions that the MEA was asked by journalists and the official spokesperson also hinted at the official position as far as the last MEA's position was concerned, that is to abide by the constitution of Bangladesh, which is basically supporting Awami League and Sheikh Hasina's position. So I think as far as India's positionality is concerned, it's very clear. It wants to uh, it wants to support or it is supporting Sheikh Hasina in this election. And it is not very much looking forward to a BNP's victory uh, in free and fair elections. But it is also not over openly making threats or openly kind of making promises in either which way. Because I think Indians have, Indian analysis is that, look, the situation on the ground is indeed very complicated. So you might make a very strong supportive statement in favor of Sheikh Hasina. And what if she actually does lose? Then what will you do? Right. So I think they're playing, they're, they're, they're being cautious in this. They're also, they're also aware that, you know, American pressure is pushing Hasina in China's direction in some ways. Um, and they cannot, if the fact that they are not able to change American mind on this is also kind of complicated, complicating India's own options there, right? It cannot openly support Hasina when the American pressure is so high because you're also kind of uh, hinting DC that you are at uh, at odds with Washington and very op very openly at odds with Washington, which you don't want to do. So I think that having said all that, look, just because you don't make statements, just because you don't say anything openly does not mean that you have a low-key role. I would say, in fact, Indian diplomats and Indian spooks right now would be working over time to kind of figure out a way that India's interests, as it sees it in Bangladesh in the next few months, they are protected. But also, while doing that, you also come to a position where whatever process happens, electoral processes happen, or some degree of transfer of power happens, it is also seen as legitimate by the people of Bangladesh. Ultimately, this is the biggest challenge for India. You are also getting a lot of, and India is getting a lot, is you know bearing a lot of diplomatic costs 
and is you know is being maligned publicly uh, popularly in bangladesh as an interfering power because of lot of the mistakes that the awami league has done not what india has done so it has to be very careful that it should not lose its kind of you know appeal as a neighboring power among the wider population of bangladesh because that is also not a very good thing you know then whoever comes to power using anti india kind of populism and that has happened in the past been for someone else will be by definition an anti india force right so you don't want the, all these concerns that you are raising or all the concerns of amili is is raising become self fulfilling prophecies that's the biggest challenge for india so i think the diplomats are trying to work what can be done in which you can secure your interests have a friendly force uh, come into power but also not lose uh, all your legitimacy uh, on the ground let's see what happens so the last question that i wanted to ask you before i let you go it's a little economical that we have seen a uh, bangladesh economic distress and the challenge it faces in repaying external debts and that's one of the criticism that's been labeled on the ruling party so how does this economic situation of factor into political crisis and what risk does it pose to the stability of the country in the longer run see that's the two three, two aspects uh, sheikh hasina has succeeded in bringing bangladesh out of acute poverty and that that the economic you know it has i mean Uh, this was this is a success story there is no doubt in my head about that right uh, to completely blame awami league or sheikh hasina for failing economically today is i think inaccurate i think sheikh hasina has done quite a bit to actually stabilize the economics of this country i think where it or where she struggled perhaps was the serious diversification of bangladeshi economy so the entire economic miracle where do where does the government or where does the state of bangladesh generate its core revenues the two core sources are at the bar one ready made garment industry that's the biggest industry and it's an export industry um and second is remittances a lot of bangladeshi is working in gulf countries and elsewhere abroad sending remittances on those are the two core sources of revenue and you cannot expect one single manufacturing sector which is ready made garments to can kind of you know really see you through to all different crises whether externally induced or internally induced and even remittances are subject to a lot of kind of currency fluctuations from abroad and we saw the double whammy that uh, that covid-19 the pandemic and and then the russian invasion of ukraine caused and the distress it brought upon a lot of uh, economies in the global south especially like those uh, of of bangladesh that those are really big challenges uh, that you know li- the limits to how far uh any government can respond to it so there is that element but also look we also forget that there are very you know these external challenges perhaps could have been weathered better had there been more integrity less corruption within the system in bangladesh it's a very very corrupt polity that we are looking at it's acutely corrupt so the institutions that are supposed to regulate these things uh, are not as independent as one would expect in a democracy right the kind of expenses that bangladesh has promised for you know let i'll give you an example the rupur nuclear power plant civil nuclear power plant i think the deal i forgetting the year i think 2013 or 14 the deal was done with the russians um india paid around 3 to 4 billion dollars to have russia build that kind of plant in tarapur historically and the bangladeshis have to pay anywhere between 3 to 14 billion so that's a lot more and where are this where is this money going right to what effect um, those are questions which have not been asked and with a country with where you're looking at you know the uh, we kind of you know forex surplus in the ballpark of 40 billion 45 billion and now it's shrinking uh, 13 billion exchequer cost to for one nuclear power plant which is to be built is very high and that's not the only one right so you have a huge debt perhaps your debt portfolio external debt portfolio is not focused only on chinese which is true but you still have a big debt portfolio in addition to re- decreasing kind of revenue sources uh, or de- de- decreasing capacities to generate revenue to ec- to offset that debt so that's a, that's that's a, that's also internal mismanagement um, which got exacerbated so yes a lot of this is fueling the political discontent today but i think this discontent would have remained regardless of the economic situation perhaps less uh, salient so to say of course the economics have worsened hasina's political situation and perhaps she would have been on much firmer ground had this not happened but at some point there would have been a moment of catching up 
where you know there's only as far as you can go in holding elections, rigging them, and coming to power and calling yourself democracy when you're actually not. Uh, there's there's limits to how far you can take that, and I think Sheikh Hasina and Awami League is reaching their limits on that count. Well, uh, that's all of the question I had to ask. So thank you, Professor, for taking your time and speaking to us. Uh, we look yeah. look forward to hosting you for your future book. Actually, India's near East, a new history when it comes out. Thank you so much, uh, Honest Critic, and the team of uh, you know uh, you know Ratandeep and the entire team of Honest Critic who has been in touch. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you.